At the end of this video, I will be dead. In the next 15 minutes, someone will knock down the door, storm the house and shoot me. Because the stuff that I'm going to discuss today has never been discussed before in front of a public. Sir, this is not correct. All the documentation is available in the public domain. Thank you, Otis. You just completely ruined the best intro I've ever come up with. <sighs> So the F-35 is currently the technologically most advanced aircraft in the world. For stealth, totally stealth, you can't see it. It is famous for its stealth, but stealth is progressively losing the effectiveness that it has been demonstrated since when it was introduced at the beginning of the 80s. It is also a technology that is becoming increasingly commoditized and it is no longer the asymmetric advantage in the hands of the United States Air Force that it used to be. And the Air Force is well aware. Actually, the obsession for stealth is still there, but the F-35 has other aces up its sleeve. Leave. It is fusion. Well, not this type of fusion. <laughs> it could be sensor fusion, data fusion, information fusion. They are different concepts, but they serve two purposes. One, give the pilot the situational awareness that is so important in air operations. Two, optimize the resources available in order to operate according to the priorities, which basically means shoot the most dangerous first. In other words, the F-35 gives the pilot so much more information than any four generation platform. And a good pilot can do a lot with that. And it is somewhat ironic, the advantage of the F-35 is based on an abstract immaterial technology. Algorithms make the difference between having the air dominance or just being a contender among the others. Those algorithms are a good portion of the American superiority in the aerospace domain. There are five main sensors on the F-35 and each one of those is probably the best money can buy in its field. The AN-APG-81 radar, the AN-ASQ-239 electronic warfare and countermeasure system, the AN-AAQ-40 electro-optical targeting system, the AN-AAQ-37 electro-optical distributed aperture system, the AN-ASQ-242 communication, navigation and identification system. Getting into the details of each one of those is basically another video for each system. What's important to understand for now is that each one of these sensors produces a wealth of data that the aircraft distills in a picture that is actually presented to the pilot or to other systems on board of the aircraft or off board. And by the way, in the case of the F-35, communication system is treated like a sensor because data flow into the aircraft from the outside through the data link. So sensor fusion is not new, it is not even a new concept. And to be honest, sensor fusion has many applications, even civilian applications, and probably the Air Force arrived quite late at the party. Staying in the military, this kind of fusion doesn't happen only in fighter jets. The work that is done by the Combat Operations Center on a ship, the work done in a battalion headquarters, they are all forms of sensor data and information fusion. The first generation of data fusion were based on correlating all the tracks and selecting the best one. The aircraft receives data from the radar, the infrared sensors, the data link, correlates them to make sure that they represent the same object, and then it either selects the best or just blends the data together. This, for example, is the kind of fusion that is available on the Eurofighter or in the first generation of the Gripen, probably. And it works. And actually, 
it works quite well. However, this approach has intrinsic limitations. If you choose the best track, you're probably throwing away other informations that could be useful. If you blend different tracks, but these are not updated exactly at the same frequency, exactly the same time, that time discrepancy is enough to degrade the quality of the track. He forgot to explain what a track is. A track is a snippet of information representing a relevant object identified by the sensor. A radar will generate a blip on the screen associated with distance, azimuth, speed, altitude, acceleration, and other properties. A record of these properties, representing a potential real object, is called a track. Thank you Otis, always precious. When the Americans started designing the F-22 in quite an unashamedly American way, they decided to go the full Monty. They decided to implement sensor and data fusion on steroids. They implemented the so-called closed-loop sensor fusion. And the F-35 later went even farther ahead with this technology, causing that dreaming look in the eyes of the pilot that fly the aircraft for the first time. So, conceptually it works like this. There is a stage where sensor data and track data from offboard sensors are collected. These data are correlated and a set of track is identified. And these data are obviously propagated to all the systems that need them, for example the human-machine interface, or for example the weapons, or eventually other aircraft through the data link. Every track comes with an estimation of its quality, position, speed, altitude, direction, acceleration, identification, how much are they reliable. This is an information included in the track. Yes, because in real life things go wrong and none of these attributes is immune from errors. Then, tracks are prioritized. That is, the system investigates the highest priority tracks automatically. For example, if you have a Su-30 that is nose hot and at about 30 miles, well, it's probably more relevant than a flight of MiG-29 uh, cold uh, 200 miles away. So there is a sensor scheduler that automatically allocates the most appropriate sensor to investigate the high priority tracks. For example, it could point the radar toward said Su-30. And then the cycle starts again. You understand that the pilot is no longer required to fiddle with the radar, the frequency, the PRF, the elevation or anything else. He is not required to make sense of the strange symbology that appears on the radar warning receiver. Everything is done automatically. It is presented as a coherent picture already integrated to the pilot and the pilot will decide how to act on it. Well, or just do nothing and hope for the best, I suppose. That's an approach too. Probably a, an approach to life, actually. But I digress. Mind, this technology is not secret, nor it is particularly advanced. There is nothing secret in this idea of closed-loop sensor fusion. It is taught in universities. Designing sensors and systems that actually use it, well, that is challenging. And it is challenging because it is complex, but even in that case, there is really no secret technology behind that. Every major aerospace nation can build its own integration. And a few beside the United States actually did. I'm not 100% certain, but I am relatively sure that the Gripen EF and the Rafale F4 have at least some form of this type of integration. The Suhoi 57 has been designed natively to make use of this type of fusion. However, closed loop fusion is only part of the picture. The way it is algorithmically implemented is as important as the correct application of the concept. And the way it was implemented on the F-35 is quite clever. On the aircraft there is a software component which is the data fusion engine. It manages the tracks that are produced by different sensors but it's 
main function is to isolate the data producers and the data consumers. It receives the data created by each data producer, the tracks created by each data producer, but it provides to each data consumer only the data that the consumer requires. In this way, if you add new data, new sensors, you only have to update the engine and not all the data consumers. The methodology used by the producers and the fusion engine to generate the tracks is very clever. So when a track is generated by a sensor, there are several measures of its quality associated with it. And this includes the bias of the sensors, that is how the sensors have been regulated to generate the data that were used to create the track. All this information, all these data on the F-35 come with the track. This quality measure on the F-35 implementation is expressed through the covariance of the sensor measurements. This is a mathematical way of characterizing the track. It tells us how interrelated are the various measures and how dispersed they are. This is a lot of data associated to each track. But the flip side is that we know much more about it and how it was obtained. I'm actually trying to skip all the mathematics associated with this subject and trying to give you a qualitative idea. So I beg forgiveness for those in the know and for everybody else, please bear with me. When the fusion engine fuses the tracks, it uses a mathematical methodology which is called a filter. The superstar for this kind of application is the Kalman filter and its derivatives. We spoke about the Kalman filter in a very old video and you can watch it if you're interested in digging a bit deeper into this subject. For now, if enough to know that the presence of the covariance in the track data allows us to calculate the terms that go into the filter in a way that gives the right weight, the right importance to every specific measurement, and it avoids the kind of mathematical pitfalls that may happen when you are doing this kind of calculations. Under certain conditions, this filter may, for example, diverge and produce nothing, no result at all, no fusion at all. It becomes incapable of correlating that specific track. The approach used on the F-35 avoids most of this. What does it mean in practice? It means that the algorithms used on the F-35 are very, very robust and do this at the expense of shuffling around and elaborating much more data than other legacy implementations. And this is one of the reasons why a custom data link was developed for the F-35. The metal data link must handle this large amount of data associated with the tracks. The data exchange between two F-35s are much richer than the data that are exchanged through legacy data links like the Link 16. In fact, the F-35 broadcasts all this track information to the other ships so each ship can rebuild the whole picture autonomously. Other legacy data link in use do have measures of the track quality but they are much, much simpler. This creates from one side the compatibility problems because, well, the two formats are different. One is much more complex than the other, but it also creates some pretty subtle mathematical problems that, please forgive me, but I'm not going into. The F-35 Fusion engine, though, can cope with both of these problems, while the opposite is not necessarily true. When you hear that the F-35 could be the centerpiece or the quarterback of a flight of fourth generation aircraft, this is exactly what they mean. It's not for the stealth and it's not for the sensor, or, or at least it's not just for those. It is the availability on the legacy data links 
of extremely high quality tracks that are generated by the fusion engine on the F-35 and then broadcast it to the other aircraft in the formation. This is the reason why we have news from Syria, for example, of aircraft that have expanded all the stores that had completed the mission but still remained in theater. The reason was to keep providing this kind of intelligence to the other aircraft. I think I need a coffee now. Okay, 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 but we are still not done. What we've seen so far is pretty much half of the world. There's an entire new class of issues that the F-35 tackles better than other platforms. How to identify the targets, how to communicate with other assets. All of this has been greatly advanced on the F-35, but, well, this will be the subject of another video. Thank you very much for being here at this point of the video. In the meanwhile, thank you. What? What? Hey! What? What is it? This is another suicidal video about the F-35, and probably it won't be the last. In fact, the subject that we are going to cover is one of the most complex when it comes to modern air combat. We are talking about target recognition. So there are some videos on YouTube that throw around the statement that the F-35 uses 400-500 data points to recognize target while the third generation aircraft use barely a dozen. I know where this is coming from, but I think it's a pretty misleading way of presenting the subject. I hope you have seen the previous video on this series. If you haven't, the link is at the end of this video. So if you have watched the previous video, you already know how the systems on the F-35 exchange data in the form of tracks. A track, in this context, is a snippet of data, or you may say a form, that contains data about something that has been detected by the sensors. In fact, we have already explained how the F-35 combines and fuses all the data coming from all the sensors to provide high-quality tracks. They give a single coherent picture about the kinematics, that is, speed, acceleration, altitude, and so on. But, as some of you have pointed out in the comments in the previous video, there is something missing, and that is the identification of the track. There are a few papers from Lockheed Martin that are in the public domain that give a sort of overview on how target recognition is working on the F-35. And like many other systems on this aircraft, they are quite different from anything else. In the F-35 literature, target recognition is called Combat ID. Combat ID is defined as the process of attaining an accurate characterization of detected objects in the joint battle space. Characterizations may include friend or foe, class, type, nationality, and even mission configuration. Uh, yes, I had to read. Target recognition usually starts from features of the detected signals like micromodulations in the radar return or features in the infrared signature of the aircraft. And these will be used to infer the identity of the track. The recognition computer algorithms are usually heuristic in nature. What they basically do is comparing the observation with a database and then make a judgment call based on empirical evidence. The F-35 is quite a radical departure from this approach. It uses a probabilistic formulation which is suited to handle ambiguous situations where a heuristic algorithm is forced to make a decision. Lockheed Martin could choose between a Bayesian approach or a dempster schaefer inference algorithm, and they choose the latter. I confess I'm familiar with Bayes statistics and I happen to have used it in my 9 to 5 job a few times. I was obviously aware of the existence of dempster schaefer but I didn't really know the details. 
So after looking it up, I tried to find a way to give an explanation that could be understandable to someone who is not familiar to this kind of statistical reasoning, and uh, I couldn't find it. However, there are several videos on YouTube that explain this type of statistics. You just have to search for Dempster Schaeffer. I leave the task of explaining Dempster Schaeffer to them because they can definitely do it better than I can. So let's just assume that the core of this mechanism is some sort of black magic. <laughs> and let's move on. The advantage of Dempster Schaeffer over Bayes or heuristic is the fact that Dempster Schaeffer is not really reliant on a priori decisions. It means that we don't need a preliminary decision, a preliminary hypothesis that if wrong could completely sidetrack us. But let's make an example. Let's suppose that we have a fighter trying to track a UFO. Or better, a UAP as they're called today. A conventional heuristic algorithm will end up telling the pilot something like, well, there is 15% probability that it is a balloon and I'm 10% confident that I'm right. So basically a useless information. A Dempster Schaefer implementation will tell the pilot something like, it's flying, it's neither friend or foe, it doesn't look like a fighter and actually doesn't look like anything that I have in my database. And mind, this approach could be really useful if you have plenty of unknown targets around you. Park this for a minute, we'll come back to it. The F-35 relies on a large database of pretty much everything the aircraft could encounter in the theater of operations. In this database, all the potential tracks are interconnected in a relational taxonomy that also implement a hierarchy that goes from the domain level on top to the specific subtype and weapons load at the bottom. The dempster schaefer algorithm creates ambiguity lists that contain all the possible options, and then it uses the database to discard all the meaningless ones. For example, today a propeller aircraft can be a fighter, and in the database there will be no propeller aircraft connected with the fighter class. At the end of the process, the dempster schaefer algorithm gives a good characterization of what is known and what is not known about the track. It gives it in a statistical way, but the pilot actually needs actionable information. In the language of the systems, we need to move from soft decisions to hard declarations. This is done by establishing a confidence threshold for the hard declarations. The system uses the database to calculate confidence score, and if the threshold is exceeded, then a hard declaration is made. And when a hard declaration is made, the identification data are attached to the track that tell you what that blip actually is, or better, what the system thinks the blip actually is. What is the final output of all this? The F-35 combat ID output on the big screen in the cockpit shows combat ID information from each level of the hierarchy. And the output also contains hard declarations that have been made by other sensors or other aircraft. It also contains the declarations that have been fused through the data link from other F-35s. So in this example, we see a Link 16 declaration, so something that is actually derived from a legacy system that has been combined with a model declaration. And I remind you, the model, the F-35 data link is considered a sensor for track management. And the final result is a high confidence declaration of another F-35 with a confidence of one. So, in the end, we have a system that gives much more information to the pilot than the other system do, and those information are much more accurate. And this feature is beloved by the pilots because it greatly improves their situational awareness, and this is 
what they need, this is what they crave. However, all of this would not be possible without the integration and the management of all the sensors on board of the aircraft. And the F-35 is particular in this respect too. But this is going to be the subject of the next video of the series. The pilot does nothing. No regulation, no bias, nothing. And if you want, the F-35 is an aircraft whose cockpit visualization is more like a video game than any other aircraft. Intro. Hey, welcome. This is the third episode of our series dedicated to the information systems on board the F-35. This is based on unclassified information derived from scientific papers from authors connected with Lockheed Martin or the program in general. I suggest you to watch the previous two episodes and the links are at the end of this video. So the problem that the F-35 designers set off to fix was the inability of the pilot to effectively manage the aircraft sensors. And this is not because the pilot is stupid or untrained, there are just too many of them and they are very complex. On a classic four-generation fighter, for example, the pilot may end up uh, endlessly fiddling with the radar and losing track of the overall picture of the battle space. This is something that pilots are trained to avoid. But this is an uphill battle. Sensors have exceeded the ability of humans to manage them properly. And so the solution was to have an algorithm managing the behavior of the information sources within the sensor fusion closed loop. It has three objectives. One, reduce pilot's workload by automating sensor actions and selections. Two, prioritize information requests considering pilot requests, background volume searches and fusion information needs. Three, reconfigure sensor assets to compensate for sensor loss or unavailability. While one and two are very well-known problems, well, even thinking of being capable of doing three, well, that's really ambitious. But this is a story for another time. Because the problem now is, how do we implement this? Obviously the F-35 is not the first aircraft ever to implement autonomous sensor management. Most of the latest versions of the 4th and 4.5 generation aircraft had some form of automated sensor management. For example, a simple track while scan mode on a radar is a basic form of automated sensor management. However, previous solutions were based on two models. The simplest form is a rule-based model where the objective is to maximize the performance of the sensors. This may seem a good thing, but the problem with this approach is that the algorithm is close coupled with the sensors. I explain. For example, you change the radar warning receiver and then basically you have to rewrite entirely this piece of software to accommodate the new type of sensor. You upgrade the radar, same thing. You are facing a big software rewrite to accommodate the changes, and so on. So other solutions have been explored where the objective this time was to maximize the accuracy of the track information. If you have seen the previous video, you already know what a track is. A track is the information associated with anything that has been detected by the sensors and this information is exchanged the aircraft systems and other aircraft. So the model is focused on maximizing the accuracy of the track data. And again, this seems a good thing. But the issue is that while the single track is optimized, the overall value that is provided to the execution of the mission, well, is not. So it may happen that valuable resources end up being wasted on unimportant tasks. So the F-35 designers had to walk the extra mile, and in this case, they flipped the entire paradigm on its head. The 
technical terms, the pilot situational awareness is defined as the combination of times and distances at which the pilot must take a decision. And the pilot awareness requirement is something that exists independently from the sensors. So the purpose in this case becomes to provide the pilot with all the relevant information to take a decision without wasting resources on irrelevant data. And you may understand that this is something very different from using the sensors at their best. So that blip that is many hundred miles away back in friendly airspace that looks like a civilian airliner, for example, well, it's not particularly important for the mission. I don't want to know the airline or the exact model. I don't care. Well, the pilot doesn't care. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means that the information boundaries and associated information needs define a dimensional space that can be used to derive a global objective function to support autonomous sensor management, and it can be used to define the sensor and fusion capabilities necessary to support these decisions. Hmm? A benefit from this mapping is that the mission goals can be directly related to the sensor capabilities in terms of range, accuracy, and latency. This allows the designer to trace system-level fusion situational awareness requirements to individual sensor performance requirements. That sounds pretty obvious, no? So without getting into the details of what a dimensional space is or what a global objective function does, this in practice means that it is, with this approach, possible to map the specific mission requirement to the specific sensor feature. Let's make an example. So if an F-35 flight wants to attack a bridge that is heavily defended by anti-aircraft defenses, it must be capable to obtain usable target data for its weapons at a safe distance from that specific type of defense. The sensor that you're using, the sensors that are installed on the plane, must be capable of that specific performance for that specific mission. Otherwise, the mission is too dangerous or uh, it's too difficult to execute uh, without too many losses. Let it sink a moment. This is a brilliant approach because it gives the pilots exactly what is needed to accomplish the mission. It is as if with the F-35 you are always guaranteed of being using the correct tool for the job. To be completely honest, I can't stop thinking that this also defines exactly what the aircraft can't do, but I'm not going into that rabbit hole. Okay, so far is the principle, but in practice, what happens? So when in the fusion loop the control is passed to the sensor management function, a few things happen. The existing tracks are prioritized in terms of the mission, as we said, or the potential threat. All the resources, the sensors, are allocated to maintain the existing tracks and improve those tracks that are relevant for the mission. While in background, search and discover always goes on to identify new tracks if they exist. The system also has a concept of sufficiency. That is, if the information about a track is sufficient to successfully execute the mission, no more resources are allocated to improve that specific track. Moreover, notice that with this approach the sensor is not important as long as the information is sufficiently accurate. That is, the elements of track characterization may be obtained by the radar, by the DAS, by the optronics, by anything else, and all of this is actually transparent to the pilot. However, the pilot can influence the prioritization according to its own judgment. He or she can define a line of sight to be preferentially investigated, or they can select a track, and that track then is automatically 
elevated in the priority list. And on the basis of this prioritization, the aircraft directs searches and scans both active and passive to improve the quality of the tracks up to the sufficient quality. The pilot does nothing. No regulation, no bias, nothing. And since the fusion loop happens around once every second, the pilot is effectively shown an evolving situation on the big screen in the cockpit. And if you want, the F-35 is an aircraft whose cockpit visualization is more like a video game than any other aircraft, at least that we know. And I personally find somewhat ironic that to be the best, or supposedly the best, well, you need to look like a video game. But as usual, this is not the full picture, because in this episode we have overlooked an extremely important sensor for the F-35, that is the data that the F-35 is receiving from the other aircraft. But this will be the subject of the fourth and last episode in this series. In the previous episode of this series dedicated to the F-35, we have discussed the way the aircraft manages tracks and sensors and how it fuses all this information. But there is still a missing point. That is how information is exchanged and integrated with other aircraft. In fact, the data received through the dedicated model data link is treated by the F-35 as if it was the output of just another sensor. And this feature has a name, Cooperative Sensing. Raw material of the F-35 information fusion system are the tracks. A track is a record containing various information about a potential detection from a sensor. We talked a lot about tracks in this series. The other videos covering them will be linked at the end of this video. So every sensor records its own type of information and the system fuses them into a single record for each track. This is not a trivial task, not at all, and in fact there is a track life cycle. A track may be a candidate, it, there may be a hard track declaration, the information may or may not be correlated and so on. The Madel data link has been designed to support the full extent of data exchange among the aircraft. The amount of information that is exchanged by the F-25 is quite large and the bandwidth is dimensioned accordingly. Like all modern data links, the model works with the messages. Where a message is a package of information broadcasted by one ship and received by the others. There are several different types of messages, some are just system messages, uh, synchronization and coordination messages, but they may also contain text, images, instruments logs, uh, maintenance records, and so on. The actual structure of these messages is not in the public domain. That's the same for many other data links. But what we know is that the track information is split in three different message types. So the model basic surveillance track provides the independent kinematic state as an estimate and the track covariance at the time of the last measurement update. It is important to note that the kinematic state for a track that has been broadcasted on this type of message could be either ranged or angle only. Keep this in mind for later. Why did I say independent? Because it is important for the stability of the algorithm that does the fusion that the information exchange does not contain information that has been previously received by another aircraft and then transmitted back. If this happens, the estimates about the track information like speed, altitude, position and so on may become very wrong very quickly. It is a case of unwanted feedback. So you may say that all the F-35 in a flight actually receive information from the other aircraft and then basically they draw their own conclusions independently. And hopefully they will be all the same. 
The model surveillance track also includes the list of the sensors that have contributed to the information that has been included, as well as some track identification summary data. And since the surveillance tracks contain just summary, then there is an entire new type of message, the XID message. The XID message contains a higher fidelity ambiguity list, for example, those derived from the IFF function, in addition to the actual measurement data and the sensor bias. In this way, each aircraft is aware of the accuracy of the identification of that specific track and the possible alternatives. And as I said before, the aircraft will draw its own conclusions. And since the XID contains just the ambiguity list, that is a pre-cooked list of what that specific track could be, there is another type of message for the actual measurement. In fact, the RF parametric message contains the electronic signal measurement data correlated with the track. So each aircraft receives each other's aircraft measurement of the electronic signature of every specific track. Why did they choose this structure that separates in three different types of messages the information that in the end of the day is all referring to the same track? Well, we don't know. But I can imagine that is related to the raw quantity of data. In fact, classic data links like, for example, the link 16, mostly exchange data, is basically a long string of text. And there's not much else in terms of information about the track. Uh, obviously, this is a generalization. There are several different types of data links, several different levels of sophistication. So, well, just bear with me. XID and the RF parametric messages, though, should be quite a large chunk of information just because of the nature of the data being exchanged. For example, the electronic signature data, they need to digitally represent the received waveforms in the electromagnetic spectrum. So I would expect that while the basic surveillance messages are exchanged basically every second, which is the frequency at which the sensor fusion loop is happening, the other messages being larger, they're probably exchanged with a lower frequency, saving some bandwidth. This is speculation, but I think it's reasonable. Zero one contact, one I'm pretty sure that those of you who have some familiarity with this kind of issues will be already thinking that, wait a minute, if the aircraft is exchanging that many data, then we can easily triangulate the position and the exact position of a track. And yes, that's exactly what is happening, but not in the way you are thinking. Obviously, this mechanism is useful when the track doesn't have a range associated, and this is more common than you may think, because every passive track pretty much doesn't have a range. So when the system receives an angle on the track, it compares the received track with its own tracks. And obviously there may be several intersections, and the fusion system must work out which is which. In fact, in some cases, this process may generate false tracks that are colloquially called ghosts. No system is 100% reliable. Actually, you may expect that the process is not straightforward at all, because A, every measurement has an error, B, the aircraft and the track are moving. As Otis mentioned before, the F-35 uses a covariance matrix to assess the error. This is a general F-35 design principle, all errors are assessed through the calculation of the covariance, but in this specific case, the aircraft must rotate the covariance matrix to be compatible with its own matrix, and then work out the error from there. And this obviously means that the receiving aircraft must have the transmitting aircraft position and spatial orientation among the data. Where are these? Well, the transmitting aircraft sends its own kinematic state through the model to the other aircraft. At the end of the day, every aircraft in the group is actually a track in 
each one of all the other aircraft participating to the same group. Okay, now it's all good. At this point, it's just basic trigonometry, right? No, wrong. Because the data that the aircraft may have received may have been measured some time ago before being processed by the system. For this reason, the algorithm includes TDOA capabilities for precision location. When an F-35 connects to a model network, the autonomous sensor manager that we have described in one of the previous videos also has the task of synchronizing the clock, so to speak. It is possible to send the exact time and place where the data were received by the transmitting aircraft. So the fusion algorithm pairs its own track with the track received by another aircraft, and after that it calculates an isochron curve. That is a curve where the TDOA is the same, which technically happened to be an hyperbole, and the position of the track is determined by the intersection of these two hyperboli. The fact that there is this time delay makes the straight lines that you would use in trigonometry uh, not adequate for the task. The paper that I have read seems to suggest that there is a master clock aircraft that distributes the clock to the other aircraft, but I'm not sure. I guess the clock could be synchronized by GPS as well. Probably you still need a mechanism contained into the model itself for redundancy, if any. We have come a long way in this series in explaining how the F-35 sensor fusion is working. It is an ingenious mechanism, a really interesting technology that is a very important asset in itself. Just this capability has really revolutionized the way air combat is approached today. This is not exclusive to the F-35, several other aircraft have some degree of this kind of integration some degree of sensor fusion. So the air coma that we are going to see today has relatively little in common with what we used to see just 20 years ago. So this technology now is dominating modern air combat, but there will be a time when even this will pass and something else will take its place. The human quest for destroying each other never stops. If you got this far in the video, thank you so much. And a big, big thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by becoming a member. There is also another way to support the channel, which is by buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I will get a small percentage and there will be no extra cost for you. <laughs> and before ending, I just want to say that there never was a special forces commando breaking into my house. What? What? Hey! What? What is it? It never happened. It was just a theatrical expedient, like when I mentioned the yes! <laughs> Oh, God. Thank you for watching.